Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to The Balance Point. We pray that you have had a wonderful time since we last got together. Today we are back in the studio and we are back recording Bible study lessons. We hope that these lessons, and we pray that these lessons are of benefit to you. Before we get started, I do want to uh, let you know that we are going to be um, moving back into more regular recording and uploading of these Bible point, uh, <laughs> Bible point, of these balance point lessons. Um, we got a little bit off track and we've had some health issues, but we are back and God is blessing us. God is maturing us. God is growing us. And God is just laying on our hearts the desire to pass on his wisdom, his love, his grace, and his mercy. And so we will be doing that on a more consistent basis. Today we are in the third part of chapter 10 of the Gospel of Luke. And the title of today's message is An Unexpected Answer. And so, with that introduction, let's bow our hearts. Heavenly Father, we just come before your throne and we just ask in the mighty, powerful name of your Son, Yeshua, that you would be with us. Father God, we come to you expecting a word from you. We come expecting your goodness. We come expecting your grace, your mercy, your glory, your power to manifest itself strong and true among your people. And Father God, we just say thank you. We thank you that you have not left us as orphans, but you have left this message for us that we might know your grace, your truth, and your love. And so Father God, have your way with this time. Glorify yourself through your word. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen and amen. So turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 20, uh, Luke chapter 10, and we're going to be beginning at verse 25. That's Luke chapter 10, verse 25. An unexpected answer. This is a very famous parable. In fact, this is, in fact, this is, um, a teaching moment in the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a moment that even secular people will quote and will use as an example of how we should live and how we should treat each other. And so let's dig into our scripture right now and look at what Jesus had to say and how this went down. Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25, and the message will be up on the screen for you. Behold, a certain Torah scholar stood up and tested him, saying, Rabbi, what? shall I do to inherit eternal life? I want to stop here for a sec, because this question did not come from a genuine desire to know what was needed in order to inherit eternal life. Rather, this question came from a place to test. Um, the King James and most modern translations, and, and I happen to be reading from the World English Bible, um, Messianic edition, call this person that questioned Jesus a lawyer. Now, here in America and here in Europe, um, when we hear the term lawyer, we're thinking of someone who goes into a court, goes into a place of trial to try a to try a series of facts to determine the guilt or the innocence or the liability 
of a participant in that court case. However, in the first century, Jewish culture, a lawyer had a different meaning. And the meaning was this. This was a person who specialized in knowing the Torah, knowing the law, and interpreting that law in terms of the law itself and the Mishnahs and, and the oral traditions. And so our scripture here says that this was a Torah expert, a, a lawyer, if you will. And he does not necessarily believe that Jesus is the anointed one, the sent one of God. And so as our scripture says, he came and tested him. And what was the test? The test was to see what Jesus would say. And, and here was a question. Rabbi, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And that's, got, that's a question that every person must grapple with. Every person must come to grips with. What shall I do to to get eternal life. If you happen to be in the secular world, about the only way that you might get eternal life or get an eternal name for yourself is to do something great, do something grand. You know, invent something great, get the Nobel Prize. Although, quite honestly, do you remember who won the Nobel Prize five years ago uh, for peace? I can't off the top of my head remember. Do you know who won the Nobel Prize for Mathematics three years ago? I, I can't tell you. Another way to gain some semblance of eternal life, semblance of eternal recognition, is maybe through philanthropy. You know, you do great things. May you give thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. You raise millions of dollars for charity. And you go out and you feed the hungry, or maybe you go out and you distribute the vaccine that saves thousands of lives. Yeah, you know, and you, uh, you know, maybe you give millions of dollars to university, and you get a statue on the university, you know, dedicated to you, or or you get a room in the library dedicated to you. Yeah, that that gets you a measure of immortality but this jewish scholar was asking what must i do to inherit eternal life and i'm certain that this scholar was hoping to catch jesus but jesus oh jesus so wise jesus turns the question back on him jesus said to him well what's written in the torah what's written in the law how do you, as in, how do you read it? What's written in the law? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And again, another very famous passage of scripture. What's that passage of scripture talking about? That passage of scripture is found in Deuteronomy and it's called the Shema. And it is the first and greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the, the, the lawyer added and love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because those two laws sum up the, entire, the entirety of the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Statements. First three have to do with loving God, honoring God. And the last seven have to do with loving and honoring our neighbor. Because see, if we have love, then we will not violate the law. So let, let's carry on in our scripture. Next slide, please. 
And then he, that's Jesus, said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, that's a lawyer, desiring to justify himself, asked Yeshua, who is my neighbor? And we're going to continue on. And so Yeshua answered him, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among robbers, who both stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, oh no, we have just lost, there we go. Now by chance, a certain priest was going down that way. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. I want to stop right there for just a sec. <coughs> now, you know what? Let, let's not stop there. Let, let's continue. In the same way, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him and passed on the other side. A certain Samaritan, as he traveled, came where he was, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He came to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring oil on and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the host, saying, Take care of him. Whatever you spend on him, I will repay when I return. Now, which of the three do you think seemed to be a neighbor to him who fell among the robbers? And he, that's the lawyer, said, he who showed most mercy to him. And then Yeshua said to him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. How do we receive eternal life? Well, we love God with everything that we have, and we love our neighbors as ourselves. But then that brings up the question, just as the lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? Now, why would he ask that? Well, in the day, if you were a good, solid, believing Jewish person in the days of Jesus, even though God's intention throughout the Old Testament was that the Jewish people would be a light to the nations and would be a beacon to draw in the Gentiles into the family of God. They didn't do that. In fact, they did what a lot of church folks do today. They're like, ooh, I got the glory of God. I'm special. You don't got the glory and you dirt. A lot of church folks today operate just like that. Just like that. And the Jewish people of the day operate just like that. In fact, what makes this story unexpected and Jesus' unexpected answer is the twist in the story. There's a twist. If you were a good Jewish person of the day of Jesus, this story, this story would hit you hard. And to get that, we have to understand the background. Jesus here, and I'm going to I'm going to summarize here right now. If you get nothing else from this lesson, get this. Our neighbor is whoever God puts in front of us. Whether we like them or whether we don't. I'm going to repeat that. Who is my neighbor? Whoever God puts in front of me. Whether I like them or whether I don't. And in this case, Jesus used the example of the Samaritan. In some ways, during Jesus' day, the Samaritan, being a Samaritan, was considered to be worse than being a Gentile. I mean, it was on par with, it was considered to be worse than being a tax collector. At least as a tax collector, you were just like a sinner. 
but it, but but it was there was a saying that, was, that you know thank God I'm not a Samaritan. Thank God I'm not a Samaritan. You see, they were considered to be traitors because they didn't keep true to the Jewish faith. They were considered to be half breeds because they didn't keep themselves separate and because they didn't trace their lineage the way that the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea did. And you see, to find this out, we, we have to go back about 600 years to when Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom, had split. And they both went downhill. Israel went downhill faster because they had no kings that actually repented of their idolatry. And so they were taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And when the Assyrians took them into captivity, they actually took and they moved the population that lived in the northern kingdom and dispersed them amongst the Syrian Empire. And then they took other people from the Syrian Empire and they moved them into the northern kingdom of Israel. And along the way, God cursed the land and the Assyrians somehow figured out, the Assyrians figured out, oh, you know what? Maybe it's because the God of this land is angry because he's not being worshipped. You know, they, they, they had this idea of um, henotheism which is the fact that different areas, different places, different peoples had different gods. So, you know, in their worldview, there would be the God of the mountain, the God of the valley, the God of the sea, you know, the, the, the God of the Israelite, the God of the Hittite. And so they figure, okay, well, what we need to do is we need to move some of their priests back. We need to move some of the people back so that the people of that land can worship that God and maybe that God will stop killing off the people that are in the land. And so they moved some of the Jewish people back into the land, back into the northern kingdom. And so what ended up happening was when they moved back in, they intermarried with the other people that were left there from where the Assyrians had moved in. And they became half-breeds. And, and so they, they lost their lineage. Or, according to the Jews in Jerusalem, they lost Elijah because after the northern kingdom fell, the southern kingdom fell to Babylon. And again, there was um, a dispersion of the Jewish people among the people of Babylon. But then after 70 years, they came back and they reestablished the temple and the temple worship. And... In doing so, they established this rule that in order to be a Jew, your lineage had to be traced through the mother. Whereas the Jews that came back to the northern kingdom said no. And at least in this part, they, they, they were correct. They said no, the lineage is traced through the father. And so there was this separation according to lineage. There's also a separation according to how they worship. The Samaritans, who were attempting to hold to the law of Moses, only accepted the Torah. Whereas the ones in Jerusalem accepted the Torah and the oral teachings. And so there was this split there. And so because of this, there was an animosity between the two groups. They would butt heads. And the Jews in Jerusalem said, no, we exclude you from the temple service here in Jerusalem because of these differences. And so the Samaritans became despised by the Jews, and the Jews were despised by Samaritans. They didn't get along. They would basically have nothing to do with each other. In fact, to give you an idea of how intense this was 
If you were a good believing Jew and you were trying to go from Jericho up to Jerusalem, you the direct route would be you would go through Samaria. But if you were a good believing Jew, you would get to Samaria, you would get to the border of Samaria, and you would cross over the Jordan River and go up the other side, and then when you got beyond the border of Samaria, you would then turn and you would cross back over the Jordan River and you'd continue your way up to Jerusalem. And then coming back, you'd reverse that process. They would not even travel through Samaria. By the way, that makes it all the more amazing when Jesus goes into Samaria in order to meet the woman at the well, John 7. But I, I don't want to get distracted. Jews would do business with Samaritans, but only in a business sense. And they made sure that when the transaction was done, they would never owe anything to a Samaritan. Again, as I said before, the Jews considered the Samaritans to be traitors, and they avoided them even more than they avoided the Gentiles. So who is our neighbors? Our neighbor is the one that we despise, and realistically, because of because of the uh, the way the story is set up, our neighbor is the one that despises us. And these are the very people that we should love. In fact, this story that Jesus told is a picture of God's love for us, and God's relationship with us you see god is a just god god does what is right he's a righteous god god is a holy god sin does not exist in god god in, in the story the priest and the levite the priest kind of represents how some people think that god behaves some people think that oh yeah because i'm a sinner because I'm fallen. God will have nothing to do with me. God will not love me. God will not. And and they they picture God as seeing me wounded, seeing seeing us wounded, and going on the other side of the street. A lot of times, as religious people, we're seen as the Levite. We're so busy about going about our holy duties, our religious duties that we don't stop for the one that's hurting. Who's our neighbor? The one that's hurting. You know, we, we behave like the righteous priest and Levite who didn't come to help because it would get him dirty. You know, being exposed to the blood that it was being spilt by this by this person who had been beat up, would have made them ceremonial unclean. How long? Just a day. End of the day, take a bath, you're ceremonial clean, clean again. And often we as believers behave like the Samaritan. We as a but I'm not the Samaritan, like the priest, like the Levite. But see, it's not so. You see, the Samaritans saw the woundedness of the man, laying and left to die, just like the devil comes in and wounds us and leaves us to die, apart from God. And the Samaritan saw that woundedness, and he was, the scripture says, he was moved with compassion. The Greek there for compassion is, it, 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 it means to be stirred up in your guts. To be stirred up. Imagine that. He was stirred. His guts were stirred to the point that he had to help the man that had been beaten up. He becomes a picture for us of God. God sees us walking on the road of life. Sees that we have been beat up. Sees our wounded and sees us bleeding and broken. And did God go by? No. Did God pass by like the gods of mankind do? No. God said, I see my people. 
I see my creation and they are hurt. And so I will stop. I will step out of eternity. And I will become one of them. I will step into their lives. And I will heal them. See, God stopped the schedule of eternity to pick us up, to heal our wounds, to pay the price for our recovery. Pay the price? Yeah. In this story, watch this. Boy, oh boy. In the story, the Samaritan takes the wounded man and carries him to the inn. And he gives the innkeeper two denarii. What was a denarii? A denarii was a coin that represented a day's worth of work. He, so, so this Samaritan takes, takes a day out of his time to take care of this wounded person left for dead. And then on the next day when he had to leave, he gives the innkeeper two days wages to put that into perspective if you make like 25 bucks an hour two days wages is like 800 dollars to take care of this man to take care of this woman man. and he says and when i return anything extra that you have spent i will repay that's so much like god who who stepped out of heaven Stepped out of his schedule in heaven and he picked us up. And he healed our wounds. And he paid the price for our recovery. God is the ultimate Samaritan. The one who is rejected. The one who is despised. Does the unthinkable. Does he unthinkable? You see, because of our rejection of him, God, being a just God, is under no obligation to heal us, to save us. Let me repeat that. Because God is a just God, God would be justified in not healing, in not saving, in not sanctifying. And yet he does. You see, this story illustrates how we should treat each other. But yes, the story is also an illustration of how God treats us. See, we're like those Jewish people who wanted nothing to do with God. We're like those Jewish people who wanted nothing to do with God. And yet... God stepped out of his way, came down, bound up our wounds, carried us to a place of safety. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> carried us to a place of safety and then paid the price for our healing. And God says, if you love me, you'll do the same. You should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This story is, our, is an example of our treatment of how we should treat our neighbors. Yes, our neighbors are the ones that we love. Yes, our neighbors are the ones that we are in agreement with. Yes, our neighbors are those who do not love us. Yes, our neighbors are those who actually hate us. But our love for the neighbor, our love for our fellow man, is manifested when we reach out to those who hate us. And when we bear their woundedness, when we carry their woundedness. Now, we can't carry their woundedness the same way that Jesus did. We're not God. But the scripture does tell us that we're to laugh with those, we're to rejoice with those who rejoice, and we're to cry with those that cry. And whether, whether they're our friend or our foe, 
you know, earlier today in our in the morning service, we prayed for a situation that's going on. And I'm not going to get into that situation because then that dates this message. But there's some bad things happening in the world right now. And we pray for the victims of these bad things. Yes, we did that. But we also pray that God would reach out to the perpetrators of these bad things and to their leaders. And that God would show himself to those people and reveal his love to those people so that they might repent and they might be healed. You see, in this way, when we do these sorts of things, we show that we are children of God. Why? How? Because we do the things that God does. We show ourselves to be children of God because we treat God. I'm sorry, because we treat others just as God has treated us. What are the marks of a child of God? We're compassionate. We are moved to feel what other people feel. This is more than just sympathy. This is more than just empathy, but we literally, what well, we figuratively, get into the shoes of the other person. Compassion means that not only are our guts moved, but compassion also carries along, carries the idea of to come alongside of. Compassion moves us to action. And what actions? When we, sh when we have been moved by compassion, first off, we stop. Our schedules get interrupted. We stop. We take note. Next, we act. We bind. We bind. We bandage up. We bring comfort. We bring, we, we, we bring cleansing. We bring comfort. We bring the environment into which healing can happen. Third thing when we have compassion is we pour. We pour into the situation. We don't pour into the situation to fan flames, but we pour into the situation to bring healing. Well, we pour. First thing we pour is we pour the oil of the Holy Spirit into the situations. And we ask God to pour, to put his Holy Spirit around, and if they're believers, upon and in, to bring healing. Because it's only God. It's only God who can bring true healing. We might be able to comfort. We might be able to, um, to, to anesthetize. To make dull. But only God can heal. We pour in wine. We pour in joy. Wine is a symbol of joy. And even in the saddest situations... Something as simple as, you don't even have to go and do anything. You don't have to even go and say anything. Sometimes it's just simply sitting down with the person that's in that situation, with the person that's hurt. And simply our presence will bring joy to them, even, even in that situation. We have a friend who just lost a family member. In fact, we have a couple of friends. They just lost family members. And, you know, I can't say we did anything that was like major, anything that was big, anything that, I mean, in the scheme of things that could be done, what we did was pfft, nothing. It, it, it was dust in the wind. Yet because we poured into the person, even though they're in a place of sadness and a place of loss, they came back and they expressed that they're also in a place of joy. So we can pour in joy. 
when we've moved into the realm of compassion, we carry. We carry the burden of our neighbor. We carry the burden of that person who who would be considered hated, and yet they are wounded, and they need help. We carry them. You know, we support them. We come alongside them. Lastly, we pay. When we are moved with compassion, we pay. Now, of course, we can't pay that ultimate price that Christ paid. But yet, in some small way, we pay. May we pay with our time. We pay with our prayer. But we pay. We pick up the, the, the cost of the other person's woundedness. You know, we follow God's example, you, you know, and if those of you that have been around Bounce Point have heard this before, we serve a God that loves to get his hands dirty. We don't serve a clean God. What do I mean by that? You go all the way back to the beginning, back to Genesis. And you <clears throat> you read how God created the heavens and the earth. And for the most part, it's God spoke, came into existence. God spoke, <coughs> came into existence. But then we get to day six. And it's time to create man. God didn't speak to make man. God took the dirt of the earth, the clay. And he formed man. That kind of implies that God got his hands dirty. And then God <coughs> blew into the nostrils of man. That implies that God got close. See, let me tell you, love is never convenient. It always costs. It's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us time. We got to stop what we're doing to help. We got to stop what, we, what we're doing to love. It's going to cost us talent. We have to use our skills to help. Okay? Just stopping isn't enough. You know, the Samaritan had to know how to care for the wounded. That, that means that we have to invest the time to learn how we care for our neighbors. And then when the time comes, we have to use that training, that talent. It's going to cost us treasure. we got to be willing to put our money where our mouth is. See, love is expensive. Love ain't cheap. How do we know that love is expensive? What did it cost God to love us? It cost God his only begotten son. What did it cost Jesus to love us? It cost him his physical life, but even more than that, it cost him separation from the Father, something that he had never experienced throughout all of eternity past. So let me ask you this. Are you ready to love? Are you ready to love like that Samaritan loved? Are you ready to be like that Samaritan and, and give up your time and give up your talent and give up your treasure? Are you ready to love? Are you ready to love like God loves you? Because if so, you'll be a reflection of the Father in heaven. And you'll be bringing his glory down. But even more important than that, you will be, you, you will be one who helps to reduce the suffering in the world. Let's bow our hearts. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time in your word. And we ask, Father God, that your grace, that your mercy would just rain down. Father God, 
change our hearts. Give us hearts of compassion. Give us hearts that are moved to come along the side of others. To love the way you love. Thank you, Father God, for this time in your word. In the mighty name of your son, Jesus, amen and amen. Now, before I leave, I want to give you the opportunity. If you've never had a relationship with God, if you have never called on Jesus to be your Savior and to be your Lord, or maybe at one point you walked with God, but you've walked away, I want to give you an opportunity right now in the quiet of your heart to do that. Because you see, here's the thing. God's never going to force you to do what you don't want to do. And that includes being saved. See, God makes everything available to be saved, and the only thing he doesn't do is just push us over. God leaves that to us. You now, there's a concept in religion called the sovereignty of man. What do you do when you realize that you're sovereign? Give that sovereignty right back to God. So today is the day and you're the person. You will make the choice and God will make the change. Without you, God won't. God's not going to force you to do anything. But without God, you can't. It's a cooperative endeavor. And so if you've never, ever given your life to the Lord right now, or if you once walk and you've walked away, Right now, in the quiet place where you're listening to this, where you're watching this video, pray this prayer with me. Father God, I was wrong. I have sinned. I have missed the mark. I have gone in my own ways, doing my own things, thinking my own thoughts. I was wrong. And I admit it. Right here before you, before the Son, before the holy angels. I ask right now, save me. I accept the gift of eternal life that your Son has given for me when he died on the cross. When he was buried in the grave and when he rose again on the third day. Thank you, Jesus. For paying the price for me. Thank you Jesus. For taking my place. On that cross. Father fill me now. With your Holy Spirit. Use me. Use me to bring your grace. Your truth. Your glory. Your life. Into this dying world. So that more might come. Into the family of faith. Thank you again, Father, for sending your Son. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me on the cross. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for drawing me to this place and this time. Amen and amen. If you have prayed that prayer, we would love to hear from you. Um, and you can contact us by going to our ministry center which is on the screen, and for those of you that can't see, it's uh, at balancepointla.org, all one word, balancepointla.org. Our alternate web address is balance-point.org, and you can fill out the little message form, and we would love to hear from you. You can also email us, if email is your method of choice, at staff, the email address is staff at balancepointla.org. That's staff at balancepointla.org. We would love to hear from you. We would love to know what God is doing in your life through Balance Point. If you need prayer and you would like for us to pray with, you, pray for you, pray with you, and agree with you in prayer, you can leave your prayer request at our prayer box. And the email address there is prayer at balancepointla.org. 
prayer at balancepointla.org. We love to take needs before the throne of God because it's part of our three pillars, of the DNA of our three pillars of word, worship, and works. And we believe that prayer, intercessory prayer, is an act of worship because we are saying that God is worthy and able to answer. <clears throat> if you're interested in joining us for live worship, you can get information about that by emailing us at staff at bounce-point.org. Um, we will eventually be going back into doing live streaming. We have just not done that. We need to get everything set back up. And so we will eventually be doing that. Um, and what we're going to do, and uh, we'll give out information about our um, online our online um, chapel, our online worship center, where you could join us for live worship. And so with that, we want to say so long until our next lesson, which will hopefully be much sooner than this one came out. Um, we will be changing our format a little bit. Um, we have, for the past few years, been teaching, you know, kind of section by section, um, breaking up chapters into logical sections. We're going to actually go back to teaching through entire chapters in one setting, but what we will probably be doing is we will break those single settings up into multiple, you know, 30 to 40 minute episodes, so they're kind of uh, podcastable. Uh, and they kind of can fit into like you know your commute time and so look forward to that this one was a little bit longer one because the Holy Spirit was just like all over this message so with that let's bow our hearts in prayer Father God we thank you for this time in your word and we ask right now in the mighty powerful name of your son Jesus that your word would just soak into our hearts that Father God that we would not just be hearers of the word but we would become doers of your word and so, Father God, we just ask right now, show us the places in our hearts that are hard, that are hard, that they might, that we might break them up, that they be prepared to receive this seed, and that they would just grow and bear fruit in Your name and in the name of Your Son, Jesus. And everybody says, Amen, and Amen.